security in both the public and private sector, Mr. Coppola occupies the top 5% of adversarial engineers. He has acted as an application security consultant, information security consultant, and data recovery specialist for Fortune 500 companies. Mr. Coppola lends his hacking expertise and knowledge to Bactera to help organizations defend themselves against the techniques modern hackers use today. So my name is William Coppola. I'm an experienced individual with 20 years of experience in hacking corporate industry. Uh, I've done quite a bit of work extensively with the U.S. Army. Uh, I've developed operating systems and a lot of applications that are currently used in the hacking industry. Um, I'm a former educator of offensive security, uh, working again in government, military, and private sector. Uh, and I'm also a presenter at Black Hat. Um, I've developed tools that have been presented there as well. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take 30 minutes today and you're going to have a conversation with an adversary. However, the talks that we're going to have are based upon scenarios in my experience where companies have done a great deal and put a lot of effort into security. However, due to certain gaps in coverage and visibility, they allow me to exploit and compromise the integrity of the business. Recon and research is the gathering and processing of publicly accessible information about a target, such as policies or regulatory agencies that require reporting of financial information or other sensitive information, such as breaches, uh, as they tie into Joe's presentation from earlier. The, uh, the process will give the advantage to the adversary by way of footprinting their target. Footprinting is an active process of gathering as much information that will describe the physical presence and the electronic presence of the company. Understanding this information can help a target, can help target the uh, uh, excuse me, can help target the business in a way by identifying IP address space or public uh, public publications uh, such as public information, uh, presentations that may contain sensitive information such as the user, the author of the document, or the software used to create it. This can help an adversary identify certain weaknesses inside of an organization, such as older versions of Office or maybe a unpatched Windows system. Um, this information can be exposed by way of metadata uh, through these documents. Uh, a lot of companies will expose these documents in way of creating marketing. Um, however, they can be used by an adversary as a way to identify your internal user naming space. So footprinting is an ideal application for an adversary to passively identify as much information about an organization as possible. They can use things such as social media. They can use sites like Facebook um, and all these other locations that have been recently brought up in the news, such as a professional organization known as LinkedIn, where employees may have a profile that describes their activities or functions inside of the business. Uh, this information can also be used by an adversary to identify avenues of attack, email addresses, direct lines of communication, such as a telephone for social engineering. Once the information has been gathered, the actual processing and analyzing the information will determine if it's going to be useful for the adversary or if it's inert. Most of the time I find, in my experience, that the most inert information can be the most revealing information. This actually ties into the way that companies and employees see themselves and they present themselves in a public way. Analyzing the information and then cataloging and categorizing the value of what this means to an adversary and how they can use it to attack your infrastructure. If you have, for example, a small company that has a handful of employees, your targeting is going to be much more specific to the individual whereas large companies who have tens of thousands of employees have a larger attack surface. And this can be a way to visualize how an attack surface might actually represent for a company. A smaller group of organized individuals are going to have a closer tie. They're going to have more communication and openness across the organization versus a larger organization that will have time delays in between this. As an adversary gathers this information, they want to visualize it. So the use of spreadsheets, Multigo and any other way that they can visualize it, uh, such as Visio, for example, can help them create strategies against the next phase of attack. 
evaluating the perimeter. Many people have a misunderstanding of what their perimeter actually represents. Everybody wants to assume that the perimeter represents the physical boundaries that are defined by your building space or your electronic space. However, we fail to identify the analog space, which is documents, which is policies and procedures that a company has to follow on a daily basis. A lot of this process we'll be describing is the actual flow and mentality that the attacker is going to take against an organization. When they try to find information, they're going to use public resources like Google or Shodan. Um, these are going to help them create a passive way of uh, gathering information to not disclose their activities to the organization or target. In my experience is as an engineer, the amount of information that's classified as inert can absolutely aid a person in finding a certain flaw or a hole into an organization. Um, this information can be IP address space, uh, DNS that will reveal what your actual fire ranges are and you'll start to see more active engagements across these IP addresses from attackers. Other information that can be exposed to a adversary might be unintentional. For example, a directory that has been open for uh, indexing. And Google is really great at doing certain things, uh, especially indexing certain information. So sensitive directories that get exposed unintentionally are great avenues for information disclosure. Um, in one particular case, I'd worked for a large credit card company, a uh, global processor, who spent millions of dollars in security, and what they found is within 30 minutes of my original OSINT, which is information gathering process, I was able to compromise the integrity of their web sphere by finding a classic ASP page indexed by Google years prior. This company spent man and man hours and hundreds of millions of dollars to make sure that they can process and make sure that they were secure. However, a simple indexing from Google expose an ASP page which was still active in the background, this active page was still being served by the server, still connected to the database, which ultimately allowed me to gather usernames and passwords, log into the VPN access, log into the VPN and gain access into their internal networks, and compromise the domain administrator account on the internal side of the corporate structures. Simply enough, it was a undiscovered bug because they ran scanners and all this other information, uh, other tools, without actually having a human analog component to understand what an adversary will do. They're not going to run tools; they're too loud. They're going to go out and, and gather as much information as possible by searching these publicly accessible sites. Once they have that information, then they become a little bit more active in their their attack processing and actually start to probe or scan the application manually. They'll walk the application, they'll use it like a user would, and record all the information. Once they find a, a spot where they can actually gain a foothold or get an error disclosure, they'll start to validate these exposures, and then you'll start to get error logs in your, your web sphere. Once they have enough information about the attack surface, they're going to start to strategize a more active attack plan. They're going to either physically go to your locations and jiggle your handles, or they're going to start interacting with your electronic front, uh, electronic front space, uh, excuse me, the electronic frontier of your organization. This can be DMZ space, this can be a VPN logon, this can be a firewall router, whatever the case might be. This can also include social engineering and phishing campaigns. Once they've identified enough users or targets, these things will start to become more impactful as the process continues. Penetrating the perimeter can be as simple as walking through the front door of, an, uh, of a business. Many companies share business uh, space that is publicly accessible. For example, uh, a shared office space. Uh, in one instance, I've actually gone into a business entered through the public access 
and had enough time to monitor the activities of the security of the building and the janitorial services and actually had identified certain pathways that didn't require authentication that gave me access into service elevators, which gave me access into levels of building security that should have been locked down. Uh, I gained access into a fire escape, which had no video coverage. The doors were alarmed. However, all of the sensors were exposed to myself and not on the inside of the door where it's the trusted space. I was able to defeat all the sensors on the door and gain access in through the door by picking the lock. And after that, I was able to gain access to the physical electronics inside the company. And I left a small device behind, which gave me network access. I left the perimeter of the building, and I was able to electronically gain access into the environment multiple times from that point on. So once the adversaries identify the attack vectors, then they start to actually penetrate them. They're going to actively identify the weaknesses. They're going to try to physically gain access as fast as possible. But at the same time, as we continue through this methodology, they may go back to the start and produce more OSINT from newly discovered assets or newly discovered vectors as they continue. Once they've gained access inside the environment, the idea is to remain as persistent as possible. This may require modifying the electronics or applications in a way to include malicious code or leaving behind a device that enables network access. This can also be as simple as disabling a lock on a door or causing a malfunction in a way that permits you to just easily ingress and egress through the building. That also falls into movement. You want to ensure that everything that's happening as an adversary is fluid. There's no hiccups, there's no uh, IDS that's going to get in the way, or that you're modifying your attack vector to avoid these things. Once you've identified all your hurdles and restrictions and all these different from compensating controls and security devices, then you can strategize your next phase of exploitation. And this is actually the most critical part of the attack. A real world scenario is not going to allow you to gain the abilities to thwart their effort. Once they've gained access, they've spent time and effort, and they want to make sure that they're going to stay in your environment as long as possible. So they've identified all the attack vectors. They've identified weaknesses and vulnerabilities inside your environment or externally still. And they're going to log and catalog these. And they're going to classify these as to which attack vector is going to produce the biggest yielded reward with the least amount of risk to that person's abilities to continue the attack. This is simple enough that if I can gain credit card information and user information and PII or HIPAA information, I'm going to extract that as fast as possible. This is also known as a smash and grab type scenario. However, an adversary may take a different approach and lay dormant and low, go slow. And this is a common buzzword in today is the dormant cyber pathogen. It doesn't mean that an actual piece of software is just laying dormant. This can actually be an intruder sitting on a device that's not being scrutinized. Once they've identified and been able to remain persistent in a device, they might do some things like administer these network devices. Um, they've captured credentials. They've logged on to your routers or firewalls or other security devices and actually administer these things to avoid being detected. One of my favorite places to embed is actually networked printers. Many of the times that I've seen the abilities to do this where companies have a third party that company who manage and maintain these printers, but they're networked and they're on the corporate network they are black box to the client, and they remain in this invisible state. However, to an adversary, that is the most likely advantage point to embed their self. Uh, one, the client has no visibility into these devices. Two, they are most likely insecure Linux devices. And three, they'd sit on a network space which most likely has lax or no egress filtering rules to the outside internet. So as an adversary, I can sit on your network printer and use that as a launching platform to conduct other attacks, as well as maintain root on this device, which you don't have visibility into. So as you 
implement your efforts to eradicate the threat. As an adversary, I can sit there and lay dormant for a year, maybe two, however long I need. I can also use that printer to attack other printers to remain embedded. Maybe the company comes out and moves a new printer in place. I have to remain as persistent as possible by hooking into as many devices as possible. And these devices, again, most of the time are black box. Once, the, once an adversary is actually embedded into the environment and the company no longer sees the threat, they can start to exfiltrate data in very covert ways, such as creating DNS, ICMP, or other types of tunnels that allow padded data. An adversary may start to encrypt data and exfiltrate it through these channels, which are unseen. Another way that I've exfiltrated information out of environments is is again using printers that have the ability to bond Wi-Fi interfaces and Ethernet interfaces and can create an ad hoc network which permeates outside the building and allows me to sit in public spaces and exfiltrate data as if I was sitting connected to your network. All in all, these phases and the process the, the adversary is doing is one to profit. There, there's money to be made as an adversary by capturing certain information, intellectual properties, PEII, or other customer information that can be sold to your competitors or given out in the black market, can be used to discredit, defame, uh, shift blame, many different reasons why an adversary does the things they do. However, once they start chaining it all together, the actual attack that was witnessed may have just been the precursory attack and not actually the impact that you're seeing. Other things that I've done in the past is I've created situations where I've tried to infect or attack the actual incident response teams of an organization by standing up a fake email server and malicious web server specifically targeting browsers and trying to trick and convince people to visit the web server with their browser from internally, from internal in the corporation's network. Once they've accessed it, inadvertently they've actually compromised their machines and as an adversary, attacking the incident response teams is critical. Once I understand what software they have, their capabilities, and I can understand what tools they have in place and their abilities to actually use these tools, I can use this information to avoid being detected or infect their machines and then sit there idly and wait for them to make the next move. But all in all, these processes chain together to allow the attacker to create strategy and unique plans of attack where a lot of the rules of engagement given to pen testers limit their visibility, limit their abilities to only one single asset. Pen testers have a unique perspective in the environment where they can actually understand the risks that are faced in common business. However, when they get limited by the rules of engagement, the visibility is minimal. It can tell you the security constraints with this one application, an adversary who's actually looking at the entire organization structure can tell you many different attacks of convergence, which is more rewarding for a business to identify all the ways that an adversary may attack their organization versus the one or two applications which have no insecurity vulnerabilities and have ways of actually mitigating these vulnerabilities on the exterior. This all comes down to education and training and experience. And one thing that the adversarial engineers of today are trying to preach is this blended blue team, red team testing known as purple teaming. This is actually quite effective in educating business to being more self-sustained, more reliable in their own internal operations to identify, mitigate, eradicate, and eliminate these low-hanging fruit and security vulnerabilities before they become security incidents. Thank you so much, William. We really appreciate your time and uh, sharing your expertise and knowledge. You really highlighted how uh, adversarial engineers can attack on multiple vectors and uh, 
create uh, and attack and exploit security weaknesses. I'd like to open this time for question and answer. If anybody in the group has a question, please type it in into the chat window and we will allow you to talk. Great. Well, if you think of a question that you'd like to ask William, or if you would like to talk to William and any of the security team later on, oh, we do have a question. Um, Shodan, how powerful is it? William? Yes. Uh, so Shodan is basically a Google bot crawler. It's a application that continuously scours IP address space to identify applications and services being offered on these IP address space. However, what's really disturbing about this is it shows a historical view. So for example, uh, my abilities to search Shodan for a very specific vulnerability. Uh, recently in the news, Symantec had some issues. Um, if you go to Shodan and simply type in in the query bar, Symantec, you'll be presented with IP addresses from around the world who currently have banners or other displayed information on their web server to display Symantec as a offering service. Attackers use this in a passive way without actually interacting with client infrastructure. And what this allows them to do is allows them to identify potential weaknesses in servers without actually directly communicating with them without exposing their IP address space or their identity and allows them to compile a list of potential vulnerable services and attack them without actually having to identify them. It's, it's the greatest thing out there in, since sliced bread when you're an adversary. It's the worst thing out there when you're an actual company trying to protect your assets. Uh, one way of defeating such services like Shodan is to identify service banners that are being displayed on these ports that are being uh, crawled in archives, and to remove any identifying information, such as modifying the banner to remove the word Symantec, would have reduced the threat landscape by not being part of these index searchable query engines, uh, such as Shodan. There's another one that also includes Nmap and allows you to actually upload your Nmap files and allow community-driven individuals to also consume this and contribute to identifying and mapping out the IP address space of a target individual network. That's very interesting. Sounds like Shonen's a very powerful, powerful program. We have another question. Wonderful. What are some of the most common weaknesses and vulnerabilities you have seen? To be honest, uh, the way that I see vulnerabilities is gaps in coverage. Um, when I try to evaluate a client of mine, I look at the operations, the daily activities, the personality, the culture, all these avenues of attack and understanding have to play in together. The most common avenue of attack that I see in today's world is web spheres. It's your, your web presence. It's the, uh, the forward-facing services that you offer your clients. Um, these allow adversaries like myself to interact with your service and probe it like a client without raising any red flags. Um, some of the most impactful vulnerabilities have allowed me to bypass their DMZ firewall and, and rules and, and ACLs due to the ability to identify password habits. So if I were to compromise a database that has customer information, I might find internal user namespace that can allow me to access other services like VPN or email. But the most impactful vulnerabilities have to do with OWASP top 10. And individually, these vulnerabilities may seem lackadaisical. Oh, you, you don't do filtering on your website, so user, uh, user input sanitation is a failure in OWASP if you look at it singularly. 
However, if you chain the ability to input unsanitized user data into an application and it processes this information, it produces errors which may allow a person to chain in cross-site scripting or cross-site request forgeries or other attack vectors. It's the chaining of these attacks that actually show the risk in the application. It's not just a single attack by itself. The, the hardest thing to convey to uh, certain companies in many ways is that as an adversary in the real world, we're going to chain these weaknesses together to create a wider gap where we can identify uh, ways of ingress and egress. Once we chain the vulnerabilities together, if you look at them from, again, a singularity perspective, and you eradicate the, how to say it, if you eradicate the low-hanging fruit, that's still not good enough to stop an adversary. Um, in many cases, I've taken applications where design functionality included the hash password with all the algorithm and the salt and all the other information as an API request. And when I brought this up as a vulnerability, the vendor quickly shot me down and told me that this is functionality and this is intended. After taking the information and chaining that with other vulnerabilities in the application and showing a deeper impact to it, the, the manufacturer and the software developers took a whole different perspective to how they manage their security programs and how they allow their clients to admin these uh, systems as well. So ultimately looking at one or two vulnerabilities and saying which is the most impactful, you have to look at the entire threat landscape of the application and how these vulnerabilities chain together to actually show true impact. Great, thank you. William, we have time for one more question. Based on your experience, what was the most or what was the worst and most surprising vulnerability that you have found in a penetration test? The most shocking vulnerability uh, would constitute a fail open scenario for a treasury management system. Um, this treasury management system was pretty well secured from a unauthenticated perspective, required you to issue credentials and if you gained physical access to the logon panel, it had pre-populated the password for you and you only had to click OK based upon the user account and ID that you're using on the Windows system. What it became very obvious to us was we couldn't just recover this password. They did a really great job at hindering the memory forensics of a person like myself by encrypting and encoding all this information. Wonderful job. Uh, spent about 15 minutes pondering how I can defeat this mechanism, and I decided we'll just append a single character, which the application allowed us to edit the password field. We appended a single character of a number one to the end of the password, proceeded to authenticate. The authentication mechanism obviously failed because the password was not true. We dumped the memory and scraped the memory to look for signs of failure, and in plain text, clear as day, was failed. The password of the actual password with my one appended to it failed authentication. After we understood what the password was, we were able, able to make ODBJ connections to the actual database without actually being authenticated on that machine. So we, we were able to bypass their authentication mechanisms and directly access critical financial information for this company. 